Welcome. And thank you for joining us. My name is Carla Kersna, and I'm a research program manager at Protocol Labs Research. And as Jason mentioned, this panel is about the role of tools in accelerating scientific discovery. So there's an ongoing debate as to whether the pace of scientific discovery is slowing. The data on this is inconclusive. It might be that the increasing complexity of research at the scientific frontier creates a perception of slowing scientific progress. In this panel, we suggest that our tools and incentive systems must be re-engineered to match the complexity of the scientific questions we face. As new generations of scientists build upon the work of their predecessors, the scientific frontier becomes denser, more complex, and more deeply entangled. In this panel, we propose the tools for discovering and navigating complex thickets of scientific evidence and tools for transferring knowledge between individuals, teams, and disciplines are especially important. Scientists cope with the increasing complexity of the knowledge frontier by studying longer, specializing more, and working in teams. Tools that assist in knowledge discovery and knowledge transfer between individuals and generations can accelerate scientific innovation. These tools include tools for discovering and mapping the knowledge frontier, tools for sharing the current position of the knowledge frontier in a discipline or a suite of disciplines, and tools for supporting, managing, and incentivizing research at the knowledge frontier. We think that one of the roles of science outside of academia is to develop and experiment with these tools and funding models. So this panel brings together some researchers from academic institutions, not-for-profit research organizations, and industry R&D labs, and we'll talk today about some current implementations of these technologies. So we'll start off with Ben Reinhardt of the Astera Institute uh, with a discussion of institutional and legal structures as tools for accelerating innovation and discovery. Next, Joel Chan of the University of Maryland's College of Information Studies will present tools for creating, navigating, and sharing composable modules of provident scientific evidence. Then I'll present some lessons we've learned at Protocol Labs Research about technological road mapping as a tool for incentive alignment and managing information flows. Uh, then next, Chung Wan Byun of the research lab AUT will discuss applying advanced language models to automate research workflows. And David Lang of the Experiment Foundation will round out the session with the discussion of prototyping new science funding models to accelerate research. The talks will be short, about five minutes, and we've left plenty of time for discussion afterward. So we look forward to chatting with you soon. And now on to Ben. All right, thanks. Um, let me just share a quick presentation. Uh, do that and do that and do that. Present. There we go. All right. Um, so I'll go through this very quickly. Uh, what I want to suggest is that uh, sort of to, to expand the we, we think of tools as um, perhaps software, perhaps uh, things that you use with your hands. I want to suggest that uh, institutional and legal structures are tools for accelerating invention and discovery, and especially in, in the meta science context. Um, so right now, uh, most, uh, as, as far as I can tell, uh, most meta scientists I would describe as either naturalists or theorists. Um, so they go out and they see what's going on in the world. Um, you know, it's like they, they watch what's going on, they make these amazing observations. Um, and then suggest theories around them. Um, but if you look at how uh, many other fields of science are conducted, uh, there's, um, there's a piece missing here. And that's, that's sort of like the experimental piece. Um, and so I wanna raise questions about how do we do experimental meta science? And uh, to some extent, there, there are experiments going on. Um, either, either you look at natural experiments or you look at um, like sort of convincing some agency somewhere to implement a new policy based on some some theory of meta science, um, but I would suggest that this is this is fairly limited. Um, and so, if we sort of step back, uh, meta science experiments are institutional experiments. Um, they're they're very coupled. 
Um, and sort of the, the, throughout the history of science, the, we've, we, you can see the, this progression of the experiments that people could do based on new tools, right? Like this is why, uh, you know, it's like some ridiculous number of Nobel prizes are given out for new microscopy techniques because uh, you, can't, um, you can't do new experiments without new tooling to either conduct the experiment or measure its results. Um, and so what I want to suggest is that by creating new institutions, that is a way to actually do these meta-scientific experiments. Um, and so how do we think about these experiments? Um, basically, when you boil it down, institutions are uh, incentives wrapped up in a coordination mechanism. Um, and so there's, there's sort of many way, different ways that you can take this. Uh, and, and perhaps we'll, we'll touch on some of that uh, later in the talk. Um, but sort of digging one level deeper, um, I want to suggest that legal structures are actually a tool to tune incentives. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's this like boring thing that people often don't like to think about, um, but there's a shocking amount of flexibility in the legal contracts that you can write. Um, and at the end of the day, those are coordination tools. Um, and so not only are institutions uh, a way to do experiments, but legal structures are also a way to do that. Um, and so, so one example and that I'm in particular working on is a, um, a institutional experiment where we're building a hybrid nonprofit and for-profit with uh, different funding structures, different legal structures um, to test out the hypothesis that there is a sort of a, a range of activities that are not being promoted right now um, and that it might be possible to do that better. And we're going into this with like uh, a ton of hypotheses. Um, and so that sort of gets into uh, the, the, the question of like what, how to actually do um, institutional experiments. And at the end of the day, it's the same way you do any scientific experiment uh, and, and use a scientific tool, which is like you go in with hypotheses, you use a lab notebook, you document it really well. Um, and uh, so what I, I sort of want to, to broadly suggest is this, this idea that um, institution, new institutions are a tool for doing uh, meta science experiments, um, particularly the legal structures of those institutions. Um, and just for, for more information about what I'm in particular working on, uh, you can go to, to that link. Um, for many other, there's, there's a lot of institutional experiments going on. Um, that perhaps need some uh, some like meta scientists to come in and like study them. Uh, uh, so maybe someone in the audience. And so I would, I would point you towards uh, some of the same Arvind's work and also the the things that David's about to talk about. Um, and if this was this was meant to be just like a little teaser, uh, if you're interested, uh, please reach out to me. Awesome. Thanks, Ben. And now on to Joel. Let's do this. Interview. Visible. <laughs> All right, let's jump in. Um, so the work that I'm going to talk about today is aimed at this goal of removing barriers to effective synthesis so any scientist can ask better questions faster um, with an emphasis on the former. Um, and a concrete example of what I mean by synthesis is something like this. Um, Esther Duffler, the Nobel Prize winner, um, recent Nobel Prize winner in economics, uh, credited a masterful survey of the literature that she got from a uh, random book chapter uh, that basically laid out the open problems and um, the paths forward through a space of questions uh, in developmental economics. And that was instrumental in guiding her path to um, applying her um, innovations in uh, experiments. So I want more of this. Uh, the problem that uh, we're facing is I'm going to argue that we have the wrong unit of analysis in our common scholarly communication infrastructure that puts a barrier to synthesis. What do I mean by that? 
if you think about the information task when you're doing synthesis, when you're looking for ideas, where you're looking through the literature, trying to make sense of a field of study, what you care about ultimately are ideas, claims, arguments, theories, and findings, and discourse relations between them. What supports each other? What opposes? Replications, contradictions between these ideas. Instead, we get documents, metadata, article types as the main uh, unit of analysis that we're able to search for, um, manage in our uh, information software and so on. That's not great. Um, if you see the symptoms everywhere. Um, so what I'm showing is a graph of the breakdown of the different tasks that's required in order to complete a systematic review. It takes a long time. Uh, I'm paying attention to the specific fact that about half of the activities on there are essentially working around the broken communication infrastructure. Right? You spend a lot of time and a lot of resources to search for the thing you actually care about. Right, Papers uh, with uh, juicy titles don't always have the thing that you want. And then you have to download them, you have to read them, you have to screen them, extract the data, and then you get to do your synthesis. Uh, it's a lot of overhead that we think is unnecessary. Um, in a wonderful workshop on uh, automation of systematic reviews over the summer, uh, I made this uh, spicy meme in response to uh, a very good discussion about um, the fact that a lot of the work that's being done innovation-wise in systematic reviews is essentially trying to compensate for the broken scholarly communication infrastructure. I uh, hope this is not too controversial, but we like this panel to be spicy. Um, so fortunately, um, it's not that we don't know what could be better. Um, so there's been a lot of work on this idea of, uh, I'm going to call them discourse graphs, where the units are not documents, but instead they're statements, something like a claim or an evidence, a uh, piece of evidence, and the relationships between them are not sort of uh, coarse citations, but are um, discourse relations like support and opposition. So it can look roughly like this. It's not always graphical, but you can think of it as an underlying graph where the units are discourse units, like statements, and the relationships are uh, not necessarily causal or ontological, but discourse. And uh, there's been a lot of work on unpacking the potential of this for actually supporting the kinds of information queries we would like to do and to get straight to the task of synthesis that we care about. There's been a lot of... Uh, wonderful technical work and infrastructure work to kind of build the warehouses um, that we can use to house these things and uh, kind of store uh, nano publications, micro publications, and so on. The problem we're facing uh, right now, in, in my view, is that um, they're still mostly empty. Um, so there's a kind of evocative phrase here of uh, at the moment, there's no more than a puddle, even though what we want is an ocean, right? We would like to have a lot more of this uh, so that we can support the synthesis that we like. I think of this as an authorship bottleneck, uh, as opposed to a kind of fundamental technical standards problem. Um, so I think we have a pretty good idea about what we want to have. Uh, we just haven't figured out how to get it. Um, people have tried lots of specialized curator models where we have um, crowdsourced um, efforts or we train specialized people. Um, and these tend to be very accurate, but they're expensive and slow and they're hard to sustain. Um, they require a lot of funding to keep going. Uh, on the flip side, um, and I do some applied machine learning on the side as well, uh, and text mining has potential down the line, uh, but for um, tasks that require a lot of accuracy, um, I don't think we're quite there yet. Um, and so I don't think it's safe to sort of do an autonomous thing by itself. Humans have to be involved somehow. So we still have to figure out this incentive problem. Um, the concept that I want to plant in your heads is this idea of scholar-powered contributions, uh, where we can integrate um, the contributions to a different kind of infrastructure um, into what scholars are already doing in their usual practices. And you can think of this as a really fun UX design problem, right? How do we build these like tools that integrate into what people are doing anyway? Um, so it's not as much of a, we have to kind of use the, the stick. So one basic implementation of this that we are betting on right now is a basic kind of three-part idea of uh, we build tools that uh, hook into your annotation and note-taking tools so that you can build a personal discourse graph, not for some unknown other, but for yourself. And we have the tool improve uh, your own thinking with discourse graph, and then we make it seamless for you to share or federate some parts of this with others that you know. Again, not some distant other. And then over time, as these grow, right, as we build momentum, then we can start to aggregate these into decentralized comments of discourse graphs. That's the rough game plan. Uh, today, I'm going to quickly show you uh, a proof of concept for what this could look like right now. Um, so 
I think there's a slightly better chance that uh, in this crowd, you may have heard of uh, the niche tool like Roam Research, uh, but we'll see. Um, so it's essentially like a, an outliner, like Workflowy, that's crossed with a wiki. Um, but you can kind of use it like a, like a Google Doc where you can sort of write things in there. So let me quickly show you uh, what it might look like. Um, so the idea is to be able to take notes uh, close to how you would normally would, right? So you can imagine saying, I have this question about uh, susceptibility of young children to COVID-19. Um, and you have a bunch of sources that you want to make sense of, like what's, how do we synthesize our, our understanding? There's no RCT that you can run uh, to really answer this question. Um, and so you can kind of make your way through uh, the papers. Um, you can go to take notes on this particular paper um, for this question and kind of take notes like you normally would, right? What are the aims of this paper? What did they do, right? You can kind of say like take notes on the data collection, um, aggregation techniques, setting and so on. And you get to the contribution, which is the thing that we actually care about, right? What is the, what's the result? Uh, the main result here is that, um, you know, this meta-analysis estimates uh, roughly two times lower susceptibility. Not definitive on its own, but it does contribute to our thinking. Um, so we're going to make this a building block. So with this extension says, let me mark this as a piece of evidence. Uh, so now it's a formal discourse graph node. Okay, what can we do with it? Um, let's say we are synthesizing, right? Instead of just a bunch of sources, we can now start to reference pieces of evidence and claims, right? So each of these things here is not a um, citation or a paper, but an actual evidence piece, right? These are all findings. And so you can start to add that to this uh, emerging synthesis and say, okay, there's also a meta-analysis that estimates lower susceptibility and then reference it. Okay. And so you're, you're drawing connections between um, all of these elements, you're building out your formal discourse graph. What do we mean by a formal discourse graph? Well, in the background, we're actually building a uh, labeled property graph, right? Which you can actually leverage. Um, so you can sort of go into like a playground and then you can run a, um, something like a, actually, let me just do it actually in front of you, right? Um, if you've seen anything like a uh, cipher or uh, ceramic um, that uh, works on labeled property graph, this is essentially a graph query, right? Find evidence where the evidence informs and question, right? You can query this. Now all these come back and you can say, now we know if you're interested in this question, we can find these evidence instead of the papers, right? And if you want to, you can pin them and you can start to use them, draw them on the map, right? Start to use them. And if you like, you can then export this into a Neo4j compatible CSV, Markdown, JSON, and so on. And you can share that with someone else who's interested in the same question uh, or your student who want, you want to onboard, so dumping a pile of papers on. Okay, so that's the proof of concept, uh, super quick. Uh, there's some key intuitions to highlight. Um, first, we wanna integrate the formal into the informal, right? So we're not, notice that nobody is writing complex XML or uh, direct coding of uh, ontologies or, or graphs. They're writing notes as they probably normally would in this software. <laughs> it's still kind of unfamiliar, but in this software, this is normal, right? You can use indentation to indicate relationships and referencing uh, formal units. And then you can translate immediately useful notes with implicit discourse structure into a reusable, shareable, explicit discourse structure. Um, and then the other key intuition is that we're not making people do this for no immediate benefit. Right, so the queries actually help people track all the evidence that they're trying to use and piece them together to help their thinking. And they can export the share with someone else that they know instead of publishing it to the open web for uh, unknown others. So those are the key intuitions that we think will help uh, kind of make this, help this uh, gain momentum. And uh, other than <laughs> uh, these, these queries, you can also imagine because it's a formal graph, you can do computations on it, right? You can use it to find evidence that supports opposes a claim, uh, compare support and opposition for a claim, compute evidential support through the graph. You can run graph queries and things like that. So we think this is a promising building block for moving beyond the PDF and iTunes for papers. We can start by just facilitating collaborative synthesis. Um, and as we gain momentum, we can scale up and we can do decentralized uh, federated uh, publications to data streams where other people can subscribe to graph queries, right? I want to know anytime Jung Wan has added a evidence that opposes some claim that I believe in, right? And be able to sort of share things that way in these decentralized peer-to-peer -peer ways uh, to respect the contextual and contentious nature of knowledge structure. Okay, so that's that's it. Uh, super fast. Um, but hopefully uh, the key points to, to keep in mind is that 
Um, we need a different infrastructure if you want to accelerate synthesis. Discourse graphs could help, but it's um, really hard to have sustainable means. And we have some pieces now that we think could help. So that's it. Oh, thanks, Joel. That's really cool. I'm going to share my screen now. Put that over there. Excellent. I hope that works. And I'd like to talk about technological road mapping as a tool for accelerating innovation. So the problems that face us at the scientific frontier are complex. And solving these complex problems will require collaboration among cognitively diverse stakeholders and across scientific disciplines, institutions, and indeed entire economic sectors. It's going to require clearly defined milestones defined using appropriate figures of merit that orient these stakeholders to the problem space and align them toward building appropriate solutions. And it's going to require the transfer of knowledge across disciplinary boundaries, institutional boundaries, and incentive systems as science becomes technology. This is a coordination problem and also a communication problem. A technological roadmap is a tool for solving scientific coordination problems. A roadmap is a comprehensive goal-centered model that describes when significant R&D milestones in an area will be reached and outlines the relationships between the milestones. It's centered around a potential breakthrough innovation, a paradigm shifting technology that influences multiple aspects of human experience like agriculture, writing, radio, the internet, things of that scale. Roadmaps concentrate expert attention on a scientific problem. A roadmap empowers researchers in fields rel relevant to the goal state to make informed decisions about how to shape their area of interest to reach that goal. So I see an effective roadmap outlining the problem space and highlighting promising routes toward a solution. It should enable distributed pathfinding where participants in the technology system can balance pursuit of their own local incentives with a broader view of the system and its global incentives and optima. A roadmap should be a living document, a process that runs on people. And a large part of its usefulness comes from the drafting process, from identifying and assembling stakeholders, from airing goals and concerns, matching interests and capabilities, sharing latent knowledge, and building consensus around key problems, milestones, and metrics. The act of structured planning and identifying dependencies can highlight useful connections and also possibilities to re-architect or recombine existing capabilities. So how do we build a roadmap? Well, broadly speaking, we start with a broad goal that can be tracked using at least one figure of merit. And these are measurable benchmarks like resolution or clock rate or something like that. Next, we start building our community. We see what we can do and are doing now in the area and find relevant stakeholders to invite to the process. And then the roadmap architects identify milestones, these pivotal developments in the evolution of the technology that can be identified using the state of our chosen benchmarks. The roadmappers can reassess the current state of the art according to the chosen metrics and criteria. And then we loop and layer steps two to four. And as we do that, the community, the roadmaps community grows as we iterate this process. So because road mapping is a community exercise, it's important to build a user interface and a user experience that allows users to easily grok and track technological milestones. The interface should allow stakeholders to populate the model with current data, to break the problem space down into discrete milestones, to identify leverage points with particularly high impact in the problem system, and drive distributed coordination around these problems. Uh, incorporating version control can enable distributed participation in roadmap creation and support a dynamic maintenance and update schedule. We want to create a reusable infrastructure for roadmap creation to enable decentralized peer-to-peer -peer incentive alignment between stakeholders. 
The goal is to make coordination easier, not just between researchers, but between researchers, funders, industry teams, ethicists, technologists, uh, industry R&D labs, anybody you know, who could be potentially be in the roadmap community. We're asking the question, since Joel brought up the topic of spicy questions, would it be possible to self-organize a grand scientific endeavor on the scale of the Apollo program or the Human Genome Project, entirely self-organized? What would the technology to support that kind of a project look like? I think part of the technological kit would be a roadmap, and I look forward to discussing this idea with you. Thank you. All right, I think I'm next. Um, hi, everyone. I am Jung Wan. Um, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Ott. Ott is a machine learning research lab, and we're building Illicit. I'm mostly going to give a demo of how Illicit works. Um, Illicit is a research assistant using language models to automate parts of the research workflow. Uh, so I'll show you what it's like, and then I'm happy to answer any questions about Illicit or working with language models. Um, so uh, this is the homepage of Illicit. There's a task drop-down menu. You can choose from a bunch of different research tasks. I'm going to focus on the literature ones we're experimenting with now, um, but there are others you can use, like finding experts, labeling data sets, uh, brainstorming, et cetera. Um, and you can go to illicit.org now and sign up for an account. And if you mention MetaScience, I will give you access. Um, so I'll, I'll choose this literature review task. And here the goal is to help, uh, help someone quickly ramp up on a domain that they don't know very much about. Um, and so I will try, uh, let's see, a question. First, the researcher can just uh, ask a question that they're interested in. So I'll do, um, how can we improve diversity in scientific disciplines? I think this was a topic of various talks in this conference. If you want, you can uh, also give a few examples to kind of guide the model a little bit more. Um, and then basically what we're going to do is we're going to use language models to generate ad additional questions that might help you answer the overall question, um, you know, kind of help you flesh out exactly what it is that you're looking for, and then retrieve papers that uh, answer those questions. So uh, right now you can get results in the CSV. I have a formatted version of this in Google Sheets. You can see it. So here are the questions that the models have generated. So my overall question was, how can we improve diversity in scientific disciplines? Um, and GPT-3 suggests thinking about how is the proportion of women in scientific disciplines changing over time? Which factors affect diversity? What are the major barriers to women and minorities entering scientific disciplines, et cetera? There's a long list. Um, we give you kind of a, what, what the language models think is the relevance of this question to your overall question. And then we're pulling in different publications that address this topic. Um, so these are the titles of those publications, what collaboration experiences across scientific disciplines and cohorts. This one you can see is completely irrelevant, right? What factors affect diversity and species composition of dry forests? So this is where it's really important, like Joel and I think others have said to um, think carefully about how researchers and people are interacting with these models and building good systems for giving them feedback and iterating. Um, and then, you know, we have kind of publication links so you can go through and read the papers and some snippets that have relevant parts of the content. Um, you can sort by citation count or by year, it's up to you. And overall, what we're trying, I mean, the kind of status quo for doing literature review is fairly sequential, right? So you go to Google Scholar, you type in a query, look at the first few results, open a few PDFs, skim through the abstracts, refine your query. Um, in general, and as a person, you can really only do one thing at a time. But with these language models, you can kind of imagine deploying a bunch of research assistants um, uh, towards different, and to explore many different research directions. So you as a researcher can kind of maintain this high level view and think at the level of what exactly are the questions that I really care about. If I were writing a one pager on this, what would I want to use? What, do I, what would I want to answer? What do I want my like subheaders to be? And then kind of review all the publications in more of a batched way. So we're taking a process that people kind of do in a one by one manual process today and trying to batch them so that you can evaluate across the whole set of relevant topics, relevant research search directions and relevant publications. Um, and then from here, there's a lot of work left to be done. This is still, still a lot of work. And ultimately we wanna to get to a point where um, we really try to minimize the amount of content someone has to absorb and maximize the amount of insight they get per like reading time basically. Um, so there are a few different directions we're thinking of here. Um, one is to get better at generating these types of questions. Like right now we have 50 kind of generated for you by default, but that's really a lot. Um, so ideally we give you back a much smaller number of questions, but they are very, they give you kind of maximal insight. So 
if you are able to get answers to each of the questions we give you, then your, you know, your question is, your overall question is answered or you got as, about as much information as you could about your overall question. So like trying to create a more formal decomposition um, here is one of our goals. Um, then another thing we wanna work on is, is pulling relevant papers as well as helping researchers um, evaluate how trustworthy those papers are. Given that right now we're kind of targeting this towards uh, people who are more generalists um, and you know, or trying to learn about a new domain, it can. A lot of the feedback we've gotten is, I don't know if, if I'm in a new domain, I don't know how to evaluate the reliability of these papers. So you know, we can give things like little like citation counts or other metadata to help them make the decision. But ideally, we have some kind of richer way of saying, here's how an expert in this domain would evaluate this paper. Maybe that expert knows about the top journals, or maybe they have other heuristics they would use. Um, and then lastly, uh, we want to eventually get to a place where we can more efficiently kind of directly answer the, the researcher's original question. Um, and there, I think what we want to work on is returning, you know, more intelligent snippets uh, than what we're currently getting, which is like a fairly naive approach. So this is probably where eventually we will just query all of Joel's annotated evidence and claims that directly answers the question. Um, but until that happens, or while we do that in parallel, we'll try to uh, actually read through the text of the paper and return the most relevant parts of the paper. We really want to minimize the experience of reading an entire paper and getting to the end and being like, that had nothing to do with what I was looking for. Um, so that's Elicit. Um, I, and you know, the, our overall kind of approach is to iterate quickly with researchers, figure out um, you know, what are the core kind of building blocks of the work that they're doing? How do we take processes that are kind of manual and ad, ad hoc and batch them? And, and you know, in this way also explore, are there, can, can the tools like these um, actually change how we think about research? Can we get research to a point where the researcher is kind of organizing their own quote team of researchers? Like every researcher has kind of a team of research assistants that are maybe language models and they are coordinating the work and thinking at a high level about the structure um, and, then, and then executing the work through in some automated means. All right, well, that is an incredibly um, tough group to follow. That was really inspiring everyone. Thanks for sharing everything. My name is David Lang. I'm gonna share my presentation right now. Um, can you guys see it? Okay, cool. Um, okay, so uh, the title of my talk is Experimenting with New Science Funding uh, Methods. Did I spell that wrong? I can't even see it. Um, I took a rather unorthodox path into science. Uh, I'm, I'm not an academic scientist. I kind of came in through the side door and, and I wanna tell you that story just so it's kind of clear. Um, my friend and I were wanted an underwater robot so we could explore a cave and we didn't have much money. And at the time, the tools uh, the, for remotely operated vehicles, ROVs, cost you know upwards of fifty thousand dollars and we just did not have that kind of money and so this was 10 years ago and so we started this website open rov and started sharing our designs of what we thought could be a lower cost model for underwater robot and at first our design was pretty um you know it barely worked um but eventually we started building this community of folks who were um excited to to um do this with us and it got better and better and we got incredibly lucky in that we got a small grant from a Ocean Foundation, who liked what we were doing, thought it was enthusiastic, and gave us $7,000 um, to build 15 more prototypes. And they said, you know, we're just going to write you a check, just bring us the receipt. So it was a really fast, small grant that got us going. And then we launched the project on Kickstarter um, and grew, and it became wildly popular. And we started this company called Open ROV, and we sold thousands of these underwater drones all over the world. Um, and now there's a, a host of these new tools for, you know, many of them for less than $1,000. You can go on Amazon and Google underwater drones. It's now a thing. And um, as part of this adventure over the past 10 years, I got invited to a number of like the, these ocean conferences with the leading ocean scientists and technologists who would have us, you know, to these conferences to explain our story. And some of the leading scientists in the world um, and leading marine technologists in the world were so amazed at what we what we had done. And this was so surprising to me because we were just two guys in the garage, incredibly constrained, and we were doing what to us seemed obvious, just asking the internet for help. Um, and my interactions with scientists over the years kind of brought me to the realization that 
scientists are actually incredibly constrained too, in the sense that they all have to publish papers constantly. And their whole careers are really dedicated on, on what fits into this unit, this really you know, kind of limiting unit of a, a publishable paper. And it creates these blind spots around tools. It creates these blind spots around um, science communication and a, and a host of other things. And so for the past 12 months, I've been really thinking about those experiences and kind of set out to answer this question is, is there a way uh, as an outsider to help make science better? And one of the things I've really hit home on is this idea of improving funding mechanisms and dynamics, because it's the thing that so many people um, so many scientists that I encountered, you know, senior scientists, early career folks had mentioned to me was seemed like a really big problem. And so I teamed up with my friend Cindy and Denny, who started this website experiment 10 years ago. It's a crowdfunding website for scientists, and um, they've raised, you know, more than $10 million for more than 1000 projects. And I created the Experiment Foundation. And our goal for the past 12 months has been to actually experiment with new ways that foundations and companies and federal agencies uh, can fund science in new ways. Um, and I, I really encourage you, if you've never been to uh, experiment, go to experiment.com and see some of the, the variety of projects that are there. There's a, it's, a, it's really an explosion of, of creativity um, in kind of small scale science. Most of the projects are less than $10,000. The average is about $5,000 on the site. And so I've tested a bunch of things, quadratic funding. I started doing some uh, playing around with NFTs for science, but the one that's really stuck and has been really interesting is this idea of angels, science angel investors, kind of micro DARPA program officers. And I got the idea from watching a meta science talk two years ago from Paula Stefan, one of the leading um, uh, economists who studies the, the, the science of science funding. And Carl Bergstrom was in the audience and asked, hey, we're here at Stanford, we're, we're in Silicon Valley, what can science funders learn from Silicon Valley? I think that's actually a really interesting question. And so I kind of mapped this out of like the, 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 the black is um, all the financial um, investors and mechanisms that exist for supporting um, ideas. And then the green is kind of the science funders. And you'll see that there's nobody who's really doing a good job in the really high risk appetite, high autonomy and smaller amounts, like really small, like $10,000 and below. Um, the NSF tries to do this, but um, you know, there's some, some good research on, on where the bureaucracy still kind of um, steps in the way. I think this actually does happen, um, and, but most of this is what Paula Stefan calls the back burner, which is um, you know, PIs or, or um, professors who have these kind of budgets that they tuck away from other grants that they can help support grad students uh, in different directions. It's not uh, ubiquitous. Um, it does happen a lot, but it's not um, something that happens all the time. And so that was my goal is like, can we formalize this? Can we create a program um, to create these science angel investors? And so I wrote this essay about it. You can read it it's at cybetter.com slash angels. And I, I'm really excited to say that we've gotten now funding for up to nine science angels that we're gonna launch this year. And so how this is actually gonna work is each of those science angels is gonna have a budget of $50,000 and they're gonna be able to put up to $5,000 really quickly into um, any project that kind of they think is, is interesting. Um, and so one of them is launching this week. Uh, and like I said, I think we'll have up to nine launching by the end of the year. So we're going to do this small, fast grants uh, test um, in real time on experiment. You're welcome to follow along. If you're interested in, in potentially participating, send me a note. Um, but yeah, it's going to be really fun. It's going to be interesting. And I think we're going to generate a lot of uh, hopefully new insight and new data on, on alternative funding mechanisms, because I really do agree with what Ben said earlier, and that there's an incredible amount of interesting insight that's happening in the meta science community, but we need more experiments. We need more data, especially uh, uh, experiments that kind of color outside the lines that we've been. Um, that we've been traditionally playing in. So anyways, happy to answer any questions about this or any of the other projects we're doing and looking forward to the discussion. All right, uh, Carola, this is the, the blind handoff to me. 
right? Exactly. The baton is passed. <laughs> Excellent. Go that way. Since you're we've, <laughs> we've already had a lively discussion uh, in the q and I do have a question for the uh, at attendees. Uh, I don't remember if we set the uh, settings for Q&A to display uh, answered questions in addition to open ones. Can somebody confirm in the chat whether they can see both open and answer questions or just open questions. Excellent. Okay, good. Yeah, so because there's some good stuff in the Q&A that I didn't want to go away. Um, and we sort of like put some answers in there, but I don't want them to, uh, to go away. Um, so I think I'll start by highlighting a fun question from the uh, from the Q&A that I think cuts across um, a couple of different, um, I think the three of us, uh, Karola, myself, and Jungwon, um, but also I think touches on the um, a potential point of disagreement between Ben and I. So since Ben is, uh, <laughs> has requested that we keep this spicy. Um, so Jennifer Byrne uh, has asked a good question about how to deal with um, evidence that's been withdrawn, uh, such as retractions. And I'll add on that um, beyond uh, formal retraction, right? So like we've now have the ability to know when things, uh, experiments haven't been replicated uh, or questions have been raised uh, about the, uh, the usefulness of the, the study. Uh, and I think it connects to, um, you know, the three of us are sort of thinking about um, mapping the moving frontier uh, of areas of research and um, how do we deal with that? And also, um, is, is it worth our while to try to still map the ideas on the frontier uh, since it could change so quickly? Uh, or is it a better use of our time to lean more quickly, more on uh, connecting people to people uh, to, to get a sense of the frontier? So since I'm the uh, moderator, I'm not gonna answer, you know, lob it to the panel uh, to discuss. Uh, <clears throat> I, I would argue very strongly that you should be mapping people on the frontier. Um, I mean, this is, this is just my, what I, I would argue is that the way we should, that like thinking about uh, sort of like some graph in terms of even like, so, so Joel, you're, you're arguing that we should think about it not as uh, sort of like papers as nodes, but as pieces of evidence as, as nodes. Um, and, and I would argue that the pieces of evidence should in fact be like edges that point us towards people. Um, because uh, I, I think, again, it's like there's, there's so much tacit knowledge in, uh, in the world of science that I, I, I think that it's, it's, a, it's a fool's errand to, to try to make all of it legible. Um, that, would be, that would be my argument. So Ben, I, I'd ask you, um, following up on that, um, you know, we, we saw a handful of really interesting demos uh, linking ideas. And of course there are others too, like Sight and, and there's a bunch of really interesting work happening there. Um, what, what are some early examples uh, of linking people or connecting people um, in new um, ways? The way that everybody actually learns about a field. Um, no, no, I'm like, not saying, have you, have you I, yeah, I know what you mean, but like-, like, like not to, Right, like the, the, not, not in terms of tools. Um, like, I mean, like the, the tools are basically like, go on Google Scholar, type in uh, a, a subject and see who has the most citations and then like, go talk to them, right? Like there, there, I haven't actually seen any tool, like, like people-centric tooling. Um, but I think the problem is that people don't scale, right? So then presumably everyone who wants to learn about computer science should go talk to the top computer science researcher, but they just can't, right? Like that person doesn't have any time. So how do you overcome that limitation? Yeah, well, I mean, I would also argue that the, the top computer science researcher is probably not the person that you necessarily want to be talking to, right? Like, like the, there's, there's probably someone who knows a specific thing. Um, so, so really what I would say is like, we need more tools to point people at the actual right person as opposed to the most prominent person. So you're, you're absolutely right that um, people that like, people don't scale, but like there's enough computer science researchers who probably have adjacent 
interests that if you can hunt them down, uh, you can find them. Like, so for example, like um, I hunted Joel down uh, one, one day and I just like sent him a cold email and I was like, yo, your, your research is like really interesting to me. Like, let's talk about it. Um, and I got way more out of that than reading. Like I read through all of his papers, but like a 30 minute conversation is yeah. way more valuable. Um, so I have a couple of different directions to plan this and I can riff because there's aren't, there aren't additional questions in the Q&A. Uh, but please, if you do have questions, please put them in the, oh, great, we have some, excellent. Okay, so these are good follows. Uh, people talk about ORCID at REST Cognito. We have a service focused on people, research cases focused on people, yes. Uh, Michael Carl says, can we just use a wiki to map the knowledge frontier? These are excellent questions. Uh, um, so can I respond to, to Richard? Because uh, yes. I, think, I think, Richard, you're probably pushing back against me, which is great. Um, uh, I, would, I would argue that ResearchGate is not, like the fundamental unit uh, in ResearchGate is uh, papers. Like ResearchGate doesn't even like, it, it's like this gated service and it doesn't even tell you people's emails. Um, I think unless you like pay money or sign up. Um, and so I think like that's, that's a fundamental failure of being focused on people. Yeah, but I wonder if like you still to figure out. I, yeah, so I, I don't disagree. I think there is, I, you know, I've, it, a lot of times talking to a person for like 60 minutes is like going to be way more efficient than do, spending that equivalent time doing really anything else if you can get access to that person um, and organizing knowledge by people I also agree with. But I wonder if they're really so distinct. So to figure out who is a relevant person, you probably still need to parse through like what they've written and what they've thought. And so maybe if you want to build a tool that is people centric, uh, that's not going to look for a lot of the a lot of the path to building that tool. It's not going to look too different than parsing documents and, and things that they've already written. So what would you say is the fastest way to get an understanding of somebody's research just thought? Would it be looking at the titles of their papers on Google Scholar, looking at a list of their co-authors, trying to build out the social graph, of the people that they write or work with? And is it are those is that even a useful distinction? Sorry, was that question uh, aimed at me or Jungwon? Either you or Jungwon, anybody wants to take it. It's... I mean, so again, I'm I'm like, this is where I, I sort of, I, I think I, I go against a lot of people, but like what I do, like I think the best thing is find someone, like find just like any start note, like find one mm. paper that's interesting, talk to the person who wrote that and be like, okay, who are the people you pay attention to? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I think my answer would be ideally get as easy as possible the like, you know, their top publications, some like web snippets about them, uh, like, you know, other thing, other like kind of information co authors affiliations and like be able to browse through them super quickly and then compare across many people to make the decision about who is most relevant. Mm. Yeah. I personally find workshops to be super valuable for. Uh, gaining access to people who are a super knowledgeable and b not over leveraged because uh, we get lots of people who are so my my concern about um, leaning on the existing uh, infrastructure for finding people uh, and that includes uh, networks of social social networks is um, I worry about um, the false negatives uh, from uh, sort of privileging uh, people who are well connected in the social network who are high in the prestige uh, hierarchy uh, and over people who have uh, different perspectives to bring that may not come to light uh, because they're not as well connected to the core. Um, and so like that's the thing I think about in the back of my head and why I think I like the idea of like if we can get to one of my secret goals is to lower the barrier to um, putting useful things out there that people can use to find you uh, like, so for example, um, you know, there's, there's nice documented bias against uh, novelty and interdisciplinarity. Uh, it's difficult to get things published. And so those kinds of perspectives have a longer lag. And so if you're using papers to find these people um, or, um, you know, other people to find them, you may have like a plus one to two, uh, <laughs> it's not very secret. Uh, it, it, yeah, so I think there's this, a lot of room for innovation there. And so that's why I like sort of mixing uh, different strategies. Um, 
if that makes sense. Should, should we should we take a stab at, at Michael's question? Yes. Carla, Carla you, yeah. seem, you seem well situated. Yeah. I was going to point I'd, that I'd be interested Carla. in your take. Yeah, yeah exactly. I'd be interested in your take on uh, on Michael's question. Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah, it is a great question. I've been chewing on it in, on a side process while listening here. Can we just use a wiki, a wiki to map the knowledge frontier? And that's interesting. We Part of, I'm thinking of, I'm going to maybe bring this back to Ben's idea of the, of the fact that perhaps people are the useful encapsulations of knowledge. A wiki is a nice way of bridging the, the difference between sort of having a, a knowledge that's ossified in text or knowledge that's static in text and, and a dynamic system of updates that's um, largely driven by a social system. When you read about the, the community that, that runs Wikipedia, there's a lot of, there's a, a very intense social dynamic behind the update process, behind the talk pages, behind the discussions of what goes into Wikipedia and what, what uh, doesn't. And would it be possible to, to port that same dynamic to a very to a fast moving frontier where you can't have the same types of appeals to authority? Um, I'm not sure that the wiki, what the wiki lacks is a sense of the goal. So at least the way I'm thinking of road mapping, it's a goal centric exercise. You identify what you want this, this positive future state to be. You're not just recording all of the information in a discipline. You're encoding, uh, encoding a subset that is relevant toward progress against this goal. And I think that because this is such so goal-driven and incentive-driven, um, that perhaps communication between individuals um, in a I'm thinking of something more like a causal influence diagram as being the better format for having this type of conversation where you're actually, you're seeing the relationships between these milestones. You're seeing how things influence other things. Um, you're not just putting knowledge in a graph and having each node have equal relevance. There's, there are weightings there and there's a directionality there that may not be present in a wiki is my long-winded response. Yeah, so Michael follows up in the chat. I think um, it's a good follow up question, I think, uh, follow up comment, because one way to interpret the question is can we just use Wikipedia uh, as our map of the knowledge frontier? And another way to interpret it is can we use wiki technology uh, as a medium for implementing a roadmap? And I think what Michael is saying that is a ladder. Uh, from the, the comment is like uh, wiki has is a suitable uh, technology but actually I didn't say but I am open to uh, if you would like to uh, follow up with your with your voice uh, I'm happy to I think do I have the power I do not have the power to ask people to uh, to speak looks like never mind uh Gosh. yeah but if you'd like to follow up in the in the chat please do uh okay another question for corolla and then i want to uh, at some point link back to the funding piece uh institutional piece uh, but andreas asks uh where does the information in the road mapping exercise come from from people reading thinking That's a really good question. I think that a lot of the initial, um, the initial stages, the initial iteration, would be based on um, literature search, and from the knowledge that's encapsulated in a small coterie of initial road mapping architects and their um, breadth first search over their social graph of experts in the relevant discipline. I think that as you loop through the process, the balance of information that's being derived from textual sources from the published literature and the balance that's coming from latent information from things that people know from their own lab praxis, from guys, from you know, a story that they heard from somebody in the next lab over, I think that begins to grow and become more important, especially at a fast moving frontier. There's a lot of stuff that has not yet been written down yet.
David, do you want to, there, this is a question from uh, Myra. You're muted. Yeah, sure. Yeah, happy to answer it. So um, I'll put this link in the chat of the one we're going to launch this week, uh, just so you have like a real live example of what we're going to do. Um, so the, the way this is going to work is we have a $50,000 budget. And so um, folks, you know, anyone can submit a project and we'll, the way that we're going to fund it is we'll, if it is relevant to ocean solutions, which is kind of a loose term we've, we've created, uh, we're going to be the first 50% of the pro 50% of the funding up to 50 or up to $5,000. So that's like functionally how it's going to work. So, you know, we see this being a really good way for projects that just need, um, you know, five to $15,000 or $20,000 to get going, to get initial data, um, uh, to get off the ground. And so the projects to, to receive, in order to receive funding, they do have to launch a uh, campaign, a project on experiment. And the reason we're doing that is, is because um, it just kind of makes them more serious about um, actually doing it. This, this process of asking for help in public is really a, it's kind of an emotional journey for folks to crowdfund. I don't know if anyone has crowdfunded for anything, but um, asking the internet for help is a really uh, sobering thing. And so we find that process to be a, a good filter for who's serious about these, these different research questions. Um, and then I'll put the link to the explanation too. The Are you planning on doing any thinking about which projects end up being most successful or impactful? Uh, we are, um, I think there's a, there's, there's different ways to measure that. Um, you know, this is this, any kind of like science of science funding question, this always comes up is like, how do you, how do we measure what's actually effective? And, um, it, it kind of stops the conversation. And so I don't want that conversation, that question to stop the conversation or the tests. In the short term, in the near term, how we're gonna measure it is additional funding that comes in. So additional funding that's raised on experiment, or if people are able to go on and get NSF grants or NIH grants or something like that, we think that's a good signal. And in fact, that's how most VCs measure their returns in the short to near term is how much additional VC funding comes in. Um, uh, in the long term, what we'd like to do is uh, use a mechanism and I have a link to the study by Wagner and Alexander. It was an assessment that they put together for 15 years of the NSF's SGER, they're called sugar grants, um, which was supposed to be their lower, their smaller high risk, high reward uh, grant program. They had this whole analysis. And so we'd like to do, you know, in five years, we'd like to do a similar um, analysis to that. That's ideal, that would be ideal. I have more questions if there aren't more questions from the audience. Um, I'm kind of curious, David, if you've seen whether um, this, uh, so I remember I read the kind of um, write up from FAST grants uh, that Tyler mm -hmm. Cowan and, the, and George Mason ran. And one of the things that I think they found was surprising was that even researchers from top institutions ended up applying for FAST grants. So you might believe that, you know, well, re researchers at like very well-known institutions might have an easy time applying for traditional grants, but they, you know, their experience said maybe not the case. And I'm curious if what you've seen so far is whether it's something similar, like, you know, researchers that you might assume ahead of time could get more traditional grants are also applying for this, or if this is encouraging kind of non-traditional researchers or like early stage researchers to participate in research. Yes, so um, his, kind of historically, who's been successful on experiment, and there's, there's published research on this, is early career researchers and women do better on the platform. Um, we see a lot of that. We see a lot of grad students. We see a lot of postdocs, like people who just need a little bit of money to to finish their studies. But we do see um, senior researchers who have some kind of crazy side project or, you know, I was talking to Dan Jaffe, who's um, here at UW uh, in University of Washington. And, he, you know, he's an established professor, but he wanted to measure air quality around um, railroads. And it was like, it was just a better fit for an experiment project to get like a community involved with that. Um, and so we, we see 
folks doing that too. So, and then we also see like DIY bio labs, like the Open Insulin Project raised its initial funding on experiments. So the kind of amateur science scene also uh, does does okay there. Um, but I, you know, if I had to like say a majority, it's the kind of grad student um, postdoc level. I'll, I would add to that though, like what we're trying to do with um, the science angel stuff, and this is something Ben and I, I've talked about too, is like, I think Ben, you call them reputational cascades or what did you call them? Something like that? Uh, it's, you could either call them like reputational cascades or like legitimacy bootstrapping. Legitimacy bootstrapping. So, you know, like you think about one of our science angels, like we're gonna pick people who are, you know, admired scientists, right? And for them to be the first backer into one of these projects and say, look, I believe in you, this is great. Um, you know, that can mean a lot for an early career researcher. I know I, I've heard that from a lot of people that like the defining moments of their uh, careers weren't just the biggest grants they got. They were the, the first ones and they were the ones where they had a senior scientist come and say, hey, this is interesting, keep going. Um, so we wanna create, it's not just about a new funding mechanism. What we're really trying to do is create like a different funding dynamic so that people feel like they're getting a boost of um, um, not just funding, but also like, hey, keep going in that direction. Like that that might be interesting. So yeah, that's that. really interesting. I, I think there was a this analysis of the emergent ventures uh, process in, along similar lines as well as like, um, I don't think they use that term legitimacy bootstrapping, but it, it matched the shape of it um, of like picking uh, promising people and avoiding them going into mediocre routes, right? Like uh, changing a trajectory. I, I think Tyler Cowen refers to that as like one of the most like high leverage activities you can do is just like encourage someone. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. So, you know, I think Emerging Ventures is very like inspirational for what we're doing with the Science Angels. I think the question yeah. becomes like, how do we make that how do we have an N of two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten of yeah. what Tyler Cohen's doing? And, and does that does that emergent ventures model scale? Can we do it with science? And can we use a tech like a platform like experiment to make to like mm -hmm. weed out any potential fraud or make this stuff um, mm -hmm. to make it better? So yeah. it's an open question. Uh, I think Ben is to leave soon, but there's a question for all panelists. So uh, from Andreas, what are some ideas for meta science that feel a bit too crazy to share publicly? And Wouldn't then, by definition we not say? I know, right? We're going to share it publicly here. Like, like, like I can't. Like by <laughs> definition, I cannot answer that question. <laughs> Next panelist. <laughs> what a provocative question. Something. Oh, something that that is 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 slightly. Uh, below that level, though, that is like, I think the question of like, what if we give funding agencies less money? Like what happens, right? Mm. Like the, the, the forbidden question of like, what happens when you like give out less money? I bet if well, do we have some data, sorry. Oh, go ahead, Carla. I mean, I think if we have, if we reason from the opposite, if we have a little bit of data from when that the NIH doubling occurred. And I think that that was, they became actually much more conservative and gave a lot more money into building infrastructure. So buildings, new labs, more senior researchers. Um, this, is, this was a time when the NIH budget for the biological and medical science was increased significantly. So, I mean, the opposite case, we have some data on. Uh, major reductions in, in an agency's budget. I don't know if they've been watched as quickly. Yeah, I mean, it's been happening, right? The, the NSF and NIH budget has been kind of squeezed. Um, I think, you know, I think that like, if I think there is a real taboo around um, funder efficiency. I mean, mm -hmm. like, you know, everyone's scared to like bite the hand, but like, I think like, you know, you try and uh, tie like bets that uh, like program officers have made and like trying to create kind of a reputational system around, um, funding mm. reputations mm. i think that is um no mm. one would go near that for mm. lots of reasons mm. so i mean that i mean to be honest with you that's a little bit crazy to share publicly and i think that's an interesting part about the science angel thing is we're actually saying hey this you you are the ones who make 
the bets. Like you, you, you're the individual making the choices here and you're going to be responsible for um, those choices. And so I think, um, you know, that kind of culpability doesn't really happen in science. There's a lot of, you know, the peer review process dominates. Um, there's not a lot of people who stick their neck out. I mean, DARPA funding is, is a little bit different than that. Um, and mm -hmm. I think that would, that might be interesting because I mean, what we see in the financial world is like investors have reputations and it's, it's really helpful for the whole system that um, there's a, like a class of investors who are making decisions and um, doing things. So um, mm -hmm. I think, I, I, you know, I think that's a, an interesting question, but I don't, I don't, I don't think anyone will go near it for a lot of re different reasons. Another yeah. topic that could be controversial is like automating grant propos proposals and grant applications. Mm -hmm. We think about this, right? Like unsurprisingly. And like on the one hand, it's just such a huge drain on researchers. I think a lot of professors, there have been stats, like they spend 40% of their time writing grant proposals. Different people have like different takes on, you know, some people feel like they're just kind of regurgitating kind of, you know, boilerplate text and they're not, it's not act like on, there could be a version of it that actually forces you to clarify like your project. Da, da, da. I think a lot of people feel like it's just kind of, you know, adhering to the process. But on the other hand, I feel like I, I think people will probably react pretty negatively to that. Um, maybe if you feel like it could be automated, then you ask, like, why does it even if like if proposals could be automatically generated, why do they exist at all? And, yeah, that's, you know, I've, I've seen that firsthand because um, James Weiss at MIT recently published a paper on Delphi. He was using machine learning to try and predict where uh, breakthrough research might happen. And just it was a pretty strong blowback from the research community that like, oh, we, we humans need to decide where we go. It can't be, um, it can't be AI. And it, it was interesting because, um, you know, it doesn't, I, I, I don't think it has to be either or. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's right in the... Yeah, along those lines, um, I've been thinking about what would happen if we stopped measuring quality altogether uh, and trying to predict impact? Um, so there's been some ideas thrown around about uh, essentially literally doing a lottery for grant funding. Mm -hmm. And just like, because the, the, the noise is so high that, um, and the cost of um, trying to measure uh, quality is high as well, um, that you might as well just do a lottery to everybody. Um, and this is not totally crazy because like the prediction problem is so hard, right? Like it's so hard to, to tell. I think it's easier to tell how risky something in, is in terms of how different it is from everyone else. Uh, but optimizing for that also seems like a bad idea. And so like, I think a crazy idea is just like do away with, uh, any kind of uh, evaluation, uh, but that doesn't seem, I don't know, like what do y'all think about that? I feel like I, this is a type of institutional experiment that Ben should run. I would love right? to compare like fund performance across one fund that just chooses randomly or one, one science research funding fund <laughs> that chooses randomly and one that is like tried to, you know, uses a status quo approach and stuff. I think this is underway. I think, mm. I think Carl Bergstrom has a paper on this and I think a few others may, mm. but, but the lottery, I mean, this has been coming up for the past few years in the meta science community. It's like, should we just yeah. do a lottery instead? Yeah. And I think the thing that's like unfortunate about that is like the conversation has kind of stopped there where it's like, mm. Let's just do a, let's just do peer review or let's just do a lottery when, mm. when there's actually hundreds of other things we can try too. And this is like, mm. I, I think, you know, you look at like the, I, I created that map of the financial investors versus the, um, the scientific investors. And, you know, I think that's the interesting part about like the angel investor idea is that like the dynamic is just so different at the, on, at that side than it. Like if you're like a private equity company or you're a banker, right? You look at risk in a specific way. If you're a NSF peer review committee that's allocating hundreds of millions of dollars, you're going to look at risk in a specific way. Mm -hmm. But these kind of, you know, new startups, we, we have the same kind of prediction problem where we don't know who's going to be really valuable. And the right thing to do is to be Y Combinator, where you just launch thousands and thousands of startups <laughs> into the world. Mm -hmm. And you, you actually push, push this kind of risk seeking behavior out to the edges at, at smaller amounts and you try and get more people 
onto the playing field to kind of try all these different directions. And so I think, you know, the, the peer review process makes sense for these huge NSF budgets, NIH budgets, but it doesn't make sense to have that same dynamic for the smaller amounts um, mm. and like out at the edges. Mm. And I think that's where like the, the highest margin um, opportunities are is to get more people, especially early career researchers who are struggling in so many other ways, right? Like there's so much other kind other kinds of pressure on, on folks in that position uh, that, you know, if we're gonna start looking for ways to uh, improve it, that's a good place to, to look and to start. Mm. And so like almost like a universal basic income, but for researchers <laughs> for early stage grants. Or... Hey, that's interesting, but that's like the Canadian model or like some of these other countries, um, you know, have, have different models like that, um, that could be compared, um, which I think has been, I don't, I don't have that literature off the top of my head, but. Hmm. So here's another potential point of disagreement then, but let me uh, highlight the response in the Q and A from Richard Ryan. Um, stop measuring impact and start measuring rigor. So that's another good like question uh, in terms of uh, it's not like peer review or no peer review, peer review, but like what is the thing that you're you're focusing on? I mean, there's some precedent for that with like uh, some journal publications are doing results blind, right? So it's like not about like trying to predict how interesting this result's going to be or whatever. It's like just focus on um, on the methods. Um, what do y'all think? So by rigor, do we mean how well you have adhered to the process that you set out, you describe and say your pre-registration report or um, how basically how well the study was conducted, how, how replicable the methods are, um, the amount of data generated. What is, what's the definition of rigor that we're adhering to here? Because I like the idea if it means that we're basically incentivizing the journal of negative results where you're incentivized to run very well-designed studies and put your data out there, publish your results so that we know when we get a null result in an area. Um, but I think I'd have to understand what the, what the rigor criterion is. Mm -hmm. I also wanna note, I, I don't know if there was a, I, I, I'm sorry for mentioning uh, the journal, uh, thing I think it's sort of like I don't want to conflate because we've been talking about funding, uh, which I think is is different potentially than uh, deciding what gets published, um, and uh, we've sort of like not been we've been dancing around a little bit in terms of like the the goals of like um, if the goal is like on the margin we need to increase more risky uh, more risky research uh, to increase the novelty frontier then um, you know, this is what we should do uh, versus if currently the, the goal is to have a better balance of um, you know, replicability to um, non-replicable results, then um, we should stop measuring impact and start measuring rigor. Um, so just to highlight, um, there's like two, potentially two things uh, being discussed in terms of, or well, I guess three, right? We talk about big funding, small funding, and now uh, journals. Um, but I don't know, maybe Richard can clarify in the chat um, what's meant by rigor. Um, while others respond. If it means no. favoring the methods over the impact section of a grant application, that is certainly one potential, that, that's, an, that's a very interesting suggestion because I think the downstream effect of it is that if you fund in that method, you will at least be, you'll be creating, again, you'll be upping the replicability of these studies. And, um, you know, if you're trying to accumulate data, sort of a survey of the field. So that's, that is a direction to potentially pursue. This question made me think of a different kind of possibly controversial question, which is, um, do you guys think researchers and academics should be, a, there should be mechanisms by which they could like be millionaires or billionaires, just like, you know, succeed in, with kind of outsized financial returns. Mm. As a result of their research. Mm -hmm. I do. Yeah. And I think there are. If they can ways. commercialize it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, I guess well, it wasn't that controversial. <laughs> Sorry, this, is a, this is a weird group. Uh, what, can you can you mentally simulate why someone might find it controversial? I well, I think back when like Jim Simons left math to do to start Rentech, he got a lot of uh, like criticism that he was selling his soul basically, and like uh. academia is pure and you shouldn't care about money. And I don't know how much of that exists in you know in which disciplines today. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's, I don't know that, yeah, I, I just, um, maybe it's like kind of related to impact thing. Presumably you'd need some way of measuring impact. And maybe some people would say it's becoming, you know, research shouldn't be so metrics oriented or so commercially oriented. It should be more open-ended and, you know, long-term and a lot of them will fail. And it's just like a very hard thing to impact. And if you or to measure impact, and if you kind of create this pressure cooker environment, it'll lead to um, worse research or some other different, just it'll distort research basically. I think it's bad for like science that, um, you know, that things have become so like citation oriented mm -hmm. and so like metric oriented. I think it's actually bad for researchers um, to focus their careers on that. Like, I think there's actually, there's a wider lens and a, having the bigger picture in mind is, you know, maybe not good for like short-term bibliometrics, but I think for like the long-term broader impact and opportunity for a scientific career, um, I think it's better to have a, the bigger picture in mind. Mm -hmm. But that's, I'm incredibly biased because I've only had this kind of outsider perspective. So I've never cared about citations and metrics. Yeah. And so like I think, just never I think matters this, me. this is a weird crowd too. Like yeah. <laughs> meta science, uh, even the academics here. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how controversial it's going to be. Yeah. Um, uh, Jungwon, the, there's a question for you from Michael about is the tool you should publicly usable? And yes. you can put a link through, I guess. Yeah, uh, you can go to illicit.org. Yeah. Uh, so I want to tie back. So we, we sort of talked about uh, mapping the frontier first, and then we talked about funding. And I want to tie it back together. So um, David and Carola, you're both on my screen side by side. And I can kind of see uh, if I can caricature a little bit. I think I'm hearing David say, do less uh, top-down selection and empower mm -hmm. uh, sort of uh, smaller angels to take, take their own bets. I didn't hear uh, anything in terms of guidelines or constraints from them other than um, you talked about the, the ocean uh, solicitation and it has to go out for an experiment. So I was curious um, about the relationship between um, that sort of uh, selection model, if you can frame it that way, and a technological road mapping model, which you can caricature as trying to get a big picture and have a thoughtful selection of the pieces uh, in that way. Uh, I'm not sure if you both of you think differently about or similar ways about um, selection, right? Like how do you how do you place your bets? Um, and maybe there's actually not a conf conflict, but I'm curious about, about um, your thoughts on that. So the concrete question for David to start with is, uh, okay. Do you do you have any constraints or guidelines you sure. put on the selection process for, for angels? Well, I think sometimes you want to be divergent in your thinking, and you want mm -hmm. lots of new ideas, and you want to be going in lots of different directions. And sometimes yeah. you want to be convergent. And I think, you know, a lot of people we were running these challenge grants at Experiment. People were like, oh, it's kind of like X Prize, and I was like, actually, it's nothing like X Prize <laughs> because X Prize mm -hmm. has a really specific mm -hmm. outcome, and they have a specific yeah. goal, and they try and bring all these different people in to solve a specific goal. Whereas when we put up a challenge grant, we have like a loose idea and we're trying to send people off in lots of different directions. So the X prize is great when you want to get to the answers. Um, mm. What we were trying to do is trying to, how can we generate lots of new questions? Mm -hmm. um, and mm. so I think that there's the, a time and place for both. I don't think that, mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's either or at all. I think sometimes you want to be doing one and sometimes you, you want to be doing the other. It, to, to my mind, where I see all the new systems and infrastructure going, where like the PARPAs and the, like the mm. focus research organizations and it, like everyone is doing a lot of, there's a lot of really interesting stuff when it comes to solving specific problems and going in a specific direction. 
Mm. What I wanted to see more innovation around is how are we going to send more people in weirder directions? Mm. And so that's kind of, that's the reason I'm focusing there is because I didn't think there was enough attention being faced, placed there, but I yeah. think both are really important. Mm. I think that's very really diplomatic. Good. That's, that's a very good point. And, and I, I have no, I've no disagreements there because I do think that these are really parallel processes or processes that have to run, be looped constantly and continually. And I think that a lot of the, the funding um, that David was talking about is about exploring, uh, even expanding our search space, seeing what is what really is the adjacent possible and beyond that. And um, the idea of a roadmap, it takes into account what we believe to be um, within reach. But again, the goal is meant to be extremely broad. It's, a, it's beyond the scope even of an X prize. It's something like fire, right? So it's something that would perhaps only emerge by aligning a huge number of incentives uh, that would, the goal might not only emerge until we've had a lot of conversations and we brought together, we brought ex um, extracted a lot of latent knowledge from experts that we didn't even know were related to this, this goal. So I think it's something that becomes um, progressively clearer as we iterate this discussion process. So again, to, uh, knowing the map um, is necessary, knowing that having a, a sense of what the territory is is necessary when you're uh, defining a path toward the goal. That was less less spicy than I hoped. <laughs> I think this is good. Um, another connection back to the earlier thread on um, people versus ideas. Um, I'm wondering about any connections back to that thread from the point of view of trying to figure out. Um, it seems like having represent, if your goal is to um, increase on the margin, the number of weird ideas that are going out and the risky bets that are happening that should be happening but are not. Um, I don't see a strong case for having uh, kind of detailed maps of uh, ideas. Um, but if you do want to sort of specify like a, what's the term you use Carola? Like causal, causal diagrams or like um, having a causal sense. influence diagram causal influence diagrams that there seems to be a uh, potential value there for having like I guess the, the question is like when you in your experience when you draw on uh, these experts are they um, are they mostly pulling from their heads or are they getting uh, information from elsewhere and this kind of touches on a question uh, that came before but we can circle back on that um, in terms of the framing of uh, you know, people versus um, ideas. I, I just noticed that a bunch of people have their hands up. I know where you are. Oh, they do. Minutes. Yeah. Oh, wow. I don't, I don't know how to like. That's my fault. Yeah. No, it's all right. I, <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. I just know we have like. No, that's great. Uh, please ignore my question because I want the, I want the attendees to, oh, there are folks for the next session. Oh, okay. Uh, okay and so that, that means that they're raising their hands, not for. <laughs> got it, got it, got it. Asking a question. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, nice. They start informing this. Excellent. Okay, cool. Uh, I do. Bro, I didn't mean to, to interrupt you. So go ahead. I think I finished it, but I don't know if Carol. No, no I want to. I want to hear the answer. It's a good yeah, question. Yeah. I, I, I am. I'm, I'm very sorry. I had my train of thoughts sort of interrupted there, and I, I was. Um, gosh. <laughs> While you're thinking, I'm going to uh, punt it to Jung Wan because I'm curious. I know you didn't show, but Elicit has that fantastic workflow of finding people as well. And so I was super curious uh, for the people mapping new areas and getting into new areas. Do you have, did you see people combine them in interesting ways? Or like, what's the relative uh, strengths and weaknesses of the different workflows? Like um, just starting with generating questions and finding papers relative to finding people and reading their papers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the reasons we launched the Find Experts workflow, which, um, like Joel said, works pretty similar to the one that I demonstrated, except each row is a person and you start with kind of like a seed list of people you're interested in, and then we'll like pull in their Google Scholar profiles, etc. Um, one of the one of the motivations was that was that some people when they're learning about a new domain want to start with the kind of top authors or like you know start in like a more people focused way so there were definitely people who use that workflow to do something similar to the literature review uh, task 
And I think similarly in literature review, part of how you evaluate whether or not a publication is legitimate is by looking at the author. So I do think there is a lot of interplay there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, Carilla, if you've caught your train of thought, that's uh, you can jump back in. If not, uh, we, we can actually wrap up soon. We're at uh, two minutes from the end. If we only have two minutes, I have one question that I've been dying to ask of you, Joel. Excellent. I'm absolutely going to punt that question you asked me and ask you. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. Two minute warning, what is the incentive for somebody to create a nanopub or participate in a discourse graph? I, you brought up the iTunes um, I, example of the iTunes for yeah. papers. And I remember the, the famous ad for that, a bunch of songs in your pocket. Yep. And the idea of ownership was really important. Mm -hmm. I know academics, sometimes they, they cling to their, they, they like to ex exert ownership over their ideas until they're ready to, to put them out into the world in the format that they choose. Yeah. So why would they choose a nanopub? So there's a very important difference in the framing between why would someone choose to publish a nanopub and why would someone choose to create something for themselves and their students? So I've observed very clear um, incentives to do that for yourself. Once you see how it improves your own thinking, uh, it helps you to like feel better about your ideas. It helps you um, not freak out when you hear, see people um, come up with papers that seem similar to yours. Um, and so those are all intrinsic motivations for why you would do something for yourself and your students. Um, you know, the students love it when <laughs> it, that they don't get like dumped like five, 50 papers. Uh, instead, they get like, a bunch of things they can consume. Um, the incentives for publishing uh, the nanopubs are uh, so thorny that I don't want to touch them <laughs> because like, there's lots of different problems in there um, that make it very difficult to, to gain traction. I don't think it's unsolvable. I just don't know how to solve it. Um, if, that, if that makes any sense. Uh, so the answer, is, the short answer is intrinsic incentives, uh, not extrinsic ones. Uh, you get better ideas, you get better papers. Um, and so it works for, I think, most of the people in the meta science crowd. Um, yeah. All right, we are at time. Uh, I don't know if the we need to do any more wrap up, um, but we don't have any op open questions. Um, thank you, everybody, for the a really robust discussion. Thank you for facilitating. Thank you. It was fun. Yeah, thank, thank you all. Um, if anybody wants to go to the Slack, we can maybe continue the chat there. But uh, you know, I certainly learned a lot. And I've already signed up for Elicit. And maybe I'll get some funny from an angel for my next grant. Um, but yeah, th thank, you, thank you very much. Um, great session. Excellent. Thank you. See you all soon. Bye. Bye.